Okay. Oh, almost there. We're just connecting. We're just connecting. All right. I'm eager. All right, we are good to go. All right, all right. Well, welcome everyone to um, uh, talk on the heart and scleroderma. Uh, my name is Ben Freed, and I'm an associate professor of medicine uh, at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist, which means that uh, I don't do procedures, uh, but I uh, read uh, echocardiograms, cardiac MRIs, cardiac CTs, etc. My um, research interests uh, are, and, and clinic, clinical interests include scleroderma, of course, um, and specifically the heart and scleroderma, right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and I want to thank uh, the, the National Scleroderma, the foundation for the opportunity to uh, present to you all today. Um, and I have no disclosures for this talk. I, I have, the, the way I put this together um, was that I have about a 20, 25 minute brief overview talk that I think will help get at some of the questions that a lot of you might have about the role of the heart and scleroderma. And then um, I wanna open it up to questions. So I want this to be uh, interactive. Um, I'm gonna do this because I can't see uh, the questions as they come up. Uh, during this presentation, we're going to wait to do live questions towards the end when I can get out of my uh, slide deck. I do have some questions that I was given beforehand that I will um, try to answer at the end of this talk, and maybe um, that will answer some of the questions you might have um, as we go through this. All right, so let's get started. Uh, this is just a rough outline of what we're going to talk about, and we'll start by talking a, a little bit about epidemiology and and the pathophysiology of this uh, of scleroderma and heart disease. So um, I, I pulled this paper up I, I, because um, it, it's interesting in the sense that uh, we've known about the heart, the role of the heart in scleroderma for a long time. This is a paper that was published in 1960 by Orem and Stokes. Um, they actually put in this paper that the first paper that came out about the heart actually has involvement in this disease is in 1924 uh, by Matsui, um, who pointed out that the heart could be specifically uh, and directly involved in scleroderma. I think what was interesting about this particular paper is the fact that the first line in their summary or conclusion was that involvement of the heart by scleroderma is comparatively rare. And that was based, of course, on um, what they had at the time in the in the 1920s and the 1960s, which wasn't much. I think nowadays we know, based on uh, much much better data, that the heart is actually involved um, a lot in in, in scleroderma. Uh, clinically, you know, clinically symptomatic patients, patients who actually have symptoms due to heart disease and scleroderma, that's only about 10 to 30 percent, which is still a, a relatively high number. But the vast majority of patients, uh, somewhere at least 70%, if not more, have some sort of subclinical disease, meaning that they have heart-related problems that are, are, are related to the scleroderma, but don't necessarily have symptoms as a result, okay? And this national, uh, this database, this is the European Scleroderma Trials and Research Database. This was um, a huge effort to collect a ton of epidemiologic data. Over 120 centers, I think, were involved. And this is probably the best data we have on um, epidemiologic data. And I want to point a couple things out here. You look at the figure on the left-hand side of your screen. For starters, you see in the blue bars, this is the entire cohort. You see that cardiac um, plays a, a large role in an adverse outcomes. Uh, in terms of percentage uh, for patients who have scleroderma. This follows, followed by lung fibrosis, pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, and cancer. And then specifically, uh, if you look at diffuse and limited variant scleroderma, you see the red bar is representative of diffuse. The diffuse variant seemed to have the most adverse outcomes due to the lung fibrosis, whereas the limited variant, which is in green here, 
seems to have the most uh, poor outcomes or adverse outcomes due to pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is really reflecting that they are different types of scleroderma. There is the more fibrotic uh, type, which is really more of the diffuse variant. And there's more of the vasculopathy type, which is more of the limited variant where we see more pulmonary arterial hypertension. But cardiac, especially in patients who have diffuse variant, is only second to lung fibrosis when it comes to adverse outcomes. And patients with diffuse variant scleroderma or systemic sclerosis are more likely uh, to have sim uh, symptoms due to heart disease and more severe symptoms. So there are um, a variety of different ways that scleroderma can uh, affect the heart. Uh, we're gonna, this is an overview of it. I'm gonna go into each one of these in detail. And you might've heard of some of these terms along the way. If we start on the left-hand side of this screen here, you see up on top, tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias. These are arrhythmias. So arrhythmia that's, it's not your normal rhythm of the heart that can have fast heart rates or Brady means low heart rates. And if you look down, you can get pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the sac around the heart, which is called the pericardium. Um, and you can get pericardial effusion. So the inflammation can actually cause fluid or edema to build up in that sac, and that can cause problems for the heart. Uh, down below that, you can get what's called systolic and diastolic right ventricular dysfunction. I'll talk about what that means in a second, but essentially the right side of the heart um, has trouble either getting the blood to the lungs or filling with blood so that it has blood to get to the lungs. If you move over to the other side of the figure, on top you have pulmonary vasculopathy. So this is where pulmonary hypertension comes into play. Below that is the coronary vessels, the blood vessels that supply blood to uh, the heart can be affected. You can get what's called spasm. Uh, you can get microvascular disease, so plaque, but in the small vessels of the heart. And then below that, you can get systolic and diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. This is the left side of the heart, the part that pumps the blood to the rest of the body. And many patients have more than one problem. They usually don't just have one of these uh, issues. And I think it goes without saying that patients who have systemic sclerosis or scleroderma are at a much higher risk of having a whole host of different heart-related problems compared to controls. This is data out of a large Danish cohort, almost 3,000 patients with scleroderma. And you can see everything in terms of uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, pericarditis that we just talked about, atrial fibrillation, which is a type of arrhythmia, everything is more common in patients with scleroderma than, than patients who do not have scleroderma. So if I really break down the pathophysiology of this disease, in other words, how the heart is affected by scleroderma, it is a combination of vasospasm. So the blood vessels of the heart are constricting, which means there's gonna be less blood flow to the heart and inflammation, which is a little hard to articulate what inflammation is, but anytime you have a cut, uh, you can get uh, irritation of that area, it can get red, it can get swollen. That's an inflammatory response, right? And, and scleroderma is an inflammatory disease. So uh, it's not surprising that this is part of um, the pathophysiology of this disease. So this is a little more uh, detailed, but essentially, if you look at the top left here of your screen, you have the vasospasm the, and you have the inflammation. The vasospasm can cause what's called focal ischemia. So ischemia is lack of blood flow. So it, blood vessel spasms and you can get a restriction in blood flow. And if you have enough of those events, which are quite common in scleroderma, you can end up with myocardial fibrosis, uh, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that's this box here. Myocardial fibrosis is what causes a lot of the heart problems. Fibrosis being scarring of the heart, very similar to what happens with the skin as well. And you can get conduction 
electrical system abnormalities. You can get that heart failure I was talking about, um, et cetera. And the inflammation contributes to the myocardial fibrosis through inflammation of the actual muscle of the heart, as well as contributing directly to the pericardial disease. So inflammation of the pericardium can lead to pericarditis, which can cause tamponade, which is when the fluid uh, accumulates in that sac around the heart and it restricts the heart from pumping um, down to uh, constriction where you don't necessarily need to have fluid, but now the inflammation of that pericardium, that sac, has happened so much that the pericardium is now really thick and it does not expand that well, and that constricts uh, the heart. Okay, so now, as I said, we're going to get into a little more detail on the cardiac manifestations of scleroderma heart disease. So we'll start with the left ventricle. I pointed that chamber out earlier. This is the part of the heart here that pumps the blood to the rest of the body, okay? And if you have left ventricular dysfunction, you can get symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath, swelling. And when you have those symptoms, that's, and they're attributed to left ventricular dysfunction, that's what we call heart failure. So I bring that term out because you might've heard that term before. Congestive heart failure is another way to say it. When you have symptoms related to left ventricular dysfunction, that's what we call heart failure. So it's mostly a clinical diagnosis, okay? And heart failure is a terrible term that we try not, we're trying to change, but it's been around for so long. It doesn't necessarily mean the heart is failing. It just means that the heart is not necessarily working the way it should. And there's two different ways that that can happen. You can get systolic dysfunction, which is when the heart pump, the actual left ventricle, which pumps the blood to the rest of the body, is not pumping normally. Sometimes some of you might have heard what's called ejection fraction. Okay. That is a measure of how well the heart is pumping blood to the rest of the body. How much blood is being ejected from the left ventricle into the rest of the body? That is ejection fraction. Normal is 55% or higher, not 100%, it's 55% or higher. So anything less than 55% is some sort of LV systolic dysfunction, okay? And then diastolic dysfunction is how the heart fills with blood. So an inability to fill with blood, right? So you can't pump any blood out to the rest of the body if you don't have blood to pump. So the left ventricle is responsible for filling with blood and then pumping the blood. So the pumping is the systolic and the filling is the diastolic. And both can be affected in scleroderma. Diastolic dysfunction is much more common in, in uh, scleroderma. And it usually happens earlier than systolic dysfunction where the actual pump starts to uh, uh, fail. Usually this process is insidious, meaning that it is, it, it's not abrupt. It's over a long period of time. Although you can have an acute process uh, acute decrease in LV function if you have something like myocarditis, which is an acute inflammation of the myocardium or the, the heart muscle itself. So this is an example of an echocardiogram. And on the left-hand side, uh, you see, I'm going to try to point it with my arrow here, a normal uh, left ventricle. Uh, and it you can compare that to the abnormal left ventricle here. I, if you look at them, you stare at them long enough, you don't have to be an echocardiographer to see that this is not squeezing or pumping as much as this. So that's how we know, and if we can measure ejection fraction, that this is going to be decreased, okay? Now, this is a complicated slide, except for the fact I... I telling it to you because I want you to be aware of this term. It's called strain or strain imaging, okay? Strain imaging is a new technique that we have on echocardiography to measure heart function. And we can do it with the left ventricle 
We can do it with the right ventricle. We can do it with a variety of different chambers of the heart. The reason I bring it up is because it is a more sensitive way to detect abnormalities in the heart muscle itself, like fibrosis, for instance, than ejection fraction. And it measures the percent change in length of the actual fibers of the muscle of the heart. Okay. Important to keep in mind that if it shows up in an echo report, the more negative that number, the better the strain, the better the function. It's just to make it more confusing. Okay. And to really try to bring this home, I'm going to give you an example of a patients with systemic sclerosis looking at both ejection fraction and strain. If you look at the left-hand side of your screen where my arrow is, the normal ejection fraction, this patient has normal ejection fraction at 60%, but their strain is reduced. I'm sorry, their strain is normal. I'm going to make it more confusing. Their strain is normal at negative 19%. This is a normal heart, normal ejection fraction, normal strain. If you look at the other side of your screen, the right side of your screen, you have a decreased ejection fraction at 45%. Remember, less than 55% is abnormal. And your strain is very abnormal at negative 3%. Remember, the more positive the strain, the worse the function. So these correlate. Now the middle is a patient who has mild disease and you can't tell it from the ejection fraction. Their ejection fraction is normal, but their strain is reduced. So that's what I mean when I say, when you add this measure to echo, you can detect these abnormalities earlier than just looking at ejection fraction. And then here is a good example how, how, how MRI is very helpful in trying to figure out what the cause of dysfunction of a chamber is. So I was talking earlier about myocarditis. Um, on, echo, on MRI, these blue arrows are showing these hyper-enhanced, this is contrast-enhanced uh, white areas within the black muscle of the heart that show myocarditis. These areas are myocarditis. You can't see this on echo, uh, MRI shows this very nicely. If you move to the right side of the heart, okay, this is the left side, here's the right side. The right side is responsible for taking blood from the body and putting it into the lungs, okay? So it's really important in patients who have scleroderma because a lot of disease is also related to the lungs. And so in patients who have RV dysfunction, can have it directly due to the scleroderma itself, the same way it affects the left ventricle, fibrosis, inflammation, et cetera. Or, and maybe more commonly, it's due to pulmonary hypertension, which I know many of you have heard about, where the pressures in the lungs increase for whatever reason, and that causes the right ventricle to not work so well because it cannot get the blood easily to the lungs when the pressure is so high. It's like plumbing. It just can't push that blood into a very high pressure system. So it starts to cause symptoms such as here. And here's an MRI example of RV dysfunction. Again, normal RV here where my arrow is on the left-hand side of your screen. This is an abnormal RV. Just stare at it for a while and you can see the difference both in size and squeezability of that chamber. MRI is very good at looking at RV function. Echo can, but it's not as good as MRI. And then again, MRI helps you to figure out what's the cause of the RV dysfunction. Remember I said pulmonary hypertension is pretty common. Well, here's one of my patients who have scleroderma, who we did a uh, uh, right heart cath, which is the way to diagnose pulmonary arterial hypertension. She didn't have it. And she had a very abnormal right ventricle. So we did an MRI and the MRI showed us that there was a lot of diffuse fibrosis within the myocardium. And that was likely the cause of her um, RV dysfunction. So again, MRI is helpful with cause. And just a couple slides showing that uh, this diffuse fibrosis of the heart, not just on the right side, but everywhere, correlates well with the skin fibrosis uh, that patients have. 
And patients not only have higher levels of diffuse fibrosis in the heart, but also in the skeletal muscles as well compared to healthy controls. And these patients can have a lot of diffuse fibrosis and not have symptoms. So these are part of that subclinical group, patients who have heart disease, but they don't have symptoms due to it. Pericardial disease, I talked about this a lot just a moment ago, but here's that pericardium, the purple around the heart itself. Uh, you can get all these different kinds of symptoms. You can have acute pericarditis uh, and have chest pain, shortness of breath, that's due to inflammation of the pericardium. And then, as I mentioned, you can get fluid. When you have inflammation, you get edema, swelling. So that's fluid accumulates in the sac. It has nowhere to go and it can constrict the heart. And then you can get constriction even without fluid when the pericardium becomes very thick, um, usually over many times of getting uh, inflamed. So again, on MRI, you can see the white arrow is pointing to this white here that's fluid around the heart, which is here. Probably echo is best for looking at fluid around the heart. Um, so you don't necessarily need MRI for that. What you really do need MRI for, which at least it's more helpful than echo, is seeing that thickened pericardium when you get that constriction with no fluid. The white arrow is pointing to that white band here. It's supposed to be so thin, this pericardial sac, but over time it's gotten very thick and inflamed. And you can see why it would constrict the heart. Um, I'm sure many of you, uh, if not yourself, know uh, patients who have scleroderma and get palpitations or lightheadedness. Many of the things that are happening, um, it's due to fibrosis of the conduction disease causing benign arrhythmias, not malignant or life-threatening, uh, usually benign. Two-thirds uh, can have what are called PVCs or premature ventricular complexes. I can explain what this means later if anyone's interested, but these are generally benign. If you have over a thousand of them in 24 hours, uh, it has been shown in patients with scleroderma to, to lead to worse outcomes. And then many of you might have worn a monitor before to try to figure out what is causing the palpitations, what type of arrhythmia is contributing. These are different types as shown here. And then pulmonary hypertension, I think there probably were many talks on this, either directly or indirectly talking about pulmonary hypertension. Well, pulmonary hypertension affects the heart. That's the, one of the biggest ways that people are affected by pulmonary hypertension is the fact that when you have increased pressure in the lung system, that causes the right ventricle to kind of blow up like this balloon and become dysfunctional, okay? And so, um, you know, anywhere from, I've heard 10 to 15 or even more percent of patients have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension can either be intrinsically within the blood vessels of the pulmonary vasculature causing RV dysfunction, or they can be due to, it can be due to interstitial lung disease, which is more due to a disease of the parenchyma, the lung tissue itself. That can also cause pulmonary arterial hypertension and then cause RV dysfunction. So the cause of the pulmonary hypertension doesn't necessarily matter as much as because of what it does to the right ventricle. All the right ventricle sees is this increase in pressure in the lungs and it can become dysfunctional. Um, and even patients who don't even have any kind of pulmonary arterial hypertension, so maybe no PAH or interstitial lung disease, can actually get LV dysfunction, as I mentioned earlier, either systolic or diastolic. And that pressure gets transmitted back to the pulmonary vasculature and then causes RV dysfunction. So it's, it can be confusing, but essentially pulmonary hypertension can come from a lot of different uh, places. All of it kind of ends in this RV or can end in this RV dysfunction here. The gold standard test for deciding whether or not someone has right uh, um, pulmonary hyper arterial hypertension is a right heart catheterization. Um, I can explain what this procedure is later if people are interested, but essentially it involves this thin catheter that's inserted through a large vein, either the jugular vein in the neck or the femoral vein in the groin, and we measure pressures, and, and that's what the procedure is. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, 
Uh, I'll start this slide or this segment of the talk by just saying there is really no FDA approved um, known specific myocardial or heart treatment in patients with scleroderma. Uh, it is, um, so, so essentially what we are doing is using medications uh, to treat these different diseases of scleroderma that we treat for things that are caused by uh, diseases other than scleroderma. Um, so we treat vasospasm, which again is a part of the pathophysiology of this disease with calcium channel blockers. Um, calcium channel blockers can help uh, decrease some of that vasospasm, for instance. Um, they can also help with arrhythmia. So people who have a lot of these extra heartbeats, it can calm down some of those extra heartbeats. Uh, ACE inhibitors and spironolactone. So ACE inhibitors, like maybe you heard of lisinopril, for instance, or ARBs like Losartan. Maybe some of you are on these drugs. We typically give these drugs for patients who have LV and RV dysfunction. Um, and so we, we, again, we'll give them to patients who have scleroderma and have LV and RV dysfunction. Diuretics for swelling, steroids and immunosuppressive therapy for myocarditis, and then pulmonary vasodilators. So drugs that open up or dilate the, the blood vessels for pulmonary arterial hypertension. That will also help the right ventricle. Uh, a word on stem cell transplantation. You know, stem cell transplantation has been shown in this study over cyclophosphamide um, to uh, improve survival in patients with scleroderma. We have shown at our institution that patients who undergo stem cell transplantation um, mostly of the diffuse variant scleroderma type, uh, appear to have improvements in their heart function, mostly measured by strain on echo, okay? So it's sensitive way to measure function, but we've shown statistically significant improvement in function um, in patients who undergo stem cell transplant. So it does seem that maybe stem cell transplantation, at least from our study, might improve cardiac dysfunction. In terms of screening, um, you know, uh, there's a word on this. I just have one slide. I took out several others that we can talk about later if needed. But I think if you were to summarize this talk, it would be this, that heart disease and scleroderma is more common than we think. And a lot of it is subclinical, meaning that patients, again, don't have symptoms from it. And we also know that heart disease, especially once patients have symptoms, can lead to worse outcomes. So we need to identify patients early on uh, where we can potentially make a difference. And right now, our therapies haven't caught quite up to the idea of actually impacting the natural history of this disease um, and certainly not curing anything, but we can interact early enough and maybe um, prolong symptoms or, or mitigate some of the symptoms that occur from this uh, disease. And so there are a lot of different algorithms out there. Um, this is one that we follow at Northwestern, and it's very similar to a lot of the other ones that you might read about where I'll, I'll put my cursor on the screen here, you follow someone who has systemic sclerosis. If they don't have any of the symptoms suggesting it's subclinical, you do a, we perform an EKG, an echo with strain, and then some, we haven't talked about this, but blood tests, BNP, um, and sometimes something else called a troponin that uh, will tell us, hopefully these are sensitive ways to tell us that something might be going on with the heart. And if there's an abnormality or if the patient has symptoms, you know, we start down the, the path of what problem do they have. If they don't have any abnormalities and they don't have symptoms, we do this on a yearly basis. Okay. That's how we screen. Now, once we've identified a problem, we break it up into all these different um, heart problems that I went through just a moment ago. And these are different pathways for how we think about uh, these different problems. So for LV dysfunction, you know, we might end up with an MRI, we might end up with a stress test. RV dysfunction, we might end up with an MRI, we might end up with a right heart catheterization, uh, et cetera. 
Okay. So um, I left some time, approximately 25 minutes here for some Q and A, because I, when I did this talk last time, there were a lot of questions that came up and we were able to be a little more interactive. I want to try to do the same thing this time. So before I get to the live questions, because I cannot see anything, any one of you, and I don't know if I'm talking to myself, um, I am going to just go through these questions one by one that were given to me before the talk um, that I assume were generated by um, patients um, and just see if maybe we answered some of these and maybe ex expand on on, uh, on the answer, if not. So uh, number one is sometimes I get a sensation that feels like my heart is fluttering. Does that mean anything? Um, so I would say that a lot of times that could mean that you're having those either extra heartbeats or some type of arrhythmia uh, that you're experiencing. Sometimes it, it's nothing. It's, it, at least we don't see anything on a monitor. But the monitor is the best way to see if the symptoms that you're ha having correlate with uh, the different things we're finding on the monitor. Whenever your doctor gives you a monitor, it's important that you take the diary that comes with it and you record what your symptoms are at the time of uh, specific things, you know, when you have the symptoms. So we can take that and say, okay, this patient had those symptoms at this time. What was happening with the rhythm at that time? Um, I want to know if I have cardiac involvement, what test should I ask my physician to order? So I think I went through a lot of these already, uh, but essentially... Uh, you start, we start with blood tests, an EKG, an echo, ideally with strain. Um, and that's, and, 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 and we do that yearly if we don't find anything, but those are probably the tests that um, should be used as a first line. When it comes to general tests, is an echocardiogram enough? I would say that if you don't have any clinical symptoms of cardiac disease and there's nothing showing up on some of those yearly tests that we do, then that's enough. However, if we do find something, um, a lot of times we will move on to different tests, like an MRI, for instance, because we can see a lot of things on the MRI that we can't with echo. Does having heart involvement always mean that I will have lung involvement too? Well, I will uh, say simply that we never say always or never because in medicine, that you always get that wrong if you say always or never. So, uh, but, but in this particular case, um, it, the answer is no. It doesn't always mean that you have lung involvement because again, the heart can be directly affected by the scleroderma affecting the muscle itself without any lung involvement. Like my patient that I showed you earlier who had right ventricular dysfunction, but no pulmonary hypertension. Uh, no, and no other type of lung disease at that time. Um, let's see, I have diffuse scleroderma. Does this mean I am more likely to develop heart disease? Uh, I would say that in general, given what we know about the statistics, the answer is probably yes, because we just see that patients with diffuse variant scleroderma are more likely to have heart disease than patients who have limited, although uh, pa patients with limited certainly can have um, heart disease. A lot of times it's because of the pulmonary arterial hypertension that they develop, but it can also be directly from the scleroderma itself. Do the symptoms of heart disease and scleroderma change if I have PAH or ILD? So pulmonary arterial hypertension or interstitial lung disease. And the answer is um, the symptoms of heart disease, which are usually RV dysfunction due to PAH or interstitial lung disease, those symptoms are usually the same. Okay, because it's symptoms due to RV dysfunction, but the cause of the RV dysfunction in this case is different. And patients who have limited are more likely to have PAH and patients who are diffuse variant are more likely to have interstitial lung disease. What does recovery look like after a right heart cath? Is it dangerous? I would say it's one of the, you know, out of all the procedures we do, um, it's one of the least dangerous procedures that we do, even though it sounds like it might be more dangerous. Um, but it, it is very straightforward, especially in our world. It's usually a same day outpatient procedure. Um, and you might or might not even get sedatives for it. Uh, but generally we have people come with you to drive you home in case you do get sedatives. It takes about 20 minutes. Most of the time is just getting set up 
Um, and uh, in terms of really bad things happening, uh, such as poking a hole in the heart or life-threatening arrhythmias, I mean, those are generally less than 1% done in, in, in a setting where the um, person who's doing it has done a lot of these. So um, not a dangerous test. And if, you, if there's suspicion that you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, it really is the gold standard test. It is the best way to make that diagnosis. Do you know of any promising therapies in the pipeline? You know, I, I, this question uh, is a little upsetting because I I don't know, of, you know, there's no therapies, as I mentioned, that are out there that are specific for the heart. Um, there are some targeted therapies for uh, fibrosis that are in sort of the animal study. Maybe some of them um, are in the human study phase. Uh, some of them are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Perfenidone, you might have heard of uh, in terms of interstitial lung disease. There was actually a, a study, a phase two trial called Parowet that was done in patients with diastolic dysfunction, not necessarily scleroderma. Results are mixed, I would say, in terms of perfenidone helping with um, the fibrosis, which is really the underlying root cause of the heart disease. And then um, I need a lung transplant, but my physician wants to run several tests on my heart. Can you explain why? You know, in, in general, anytime anyone goes for um, lung or liver or kidney um, transplant, we need to make sure the heart is healthy enough to withstand that transplant. And so uh, usually we're going to do, and it depends on what the protocol is, but we will almost certainly do an echocardiogram and sometimes we need to do even more like usually in a lung transplant setting, we're going to do a right heart catheterization uh, to measure pressures in the lungs, to look for pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's why uh, physicians want to run tests on the heart. Um, so I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And... Um, I, uh, I'm back now on the main homepage and we have, see, so I have to, 37 minutes. So we have, um, time for some questions and let me see if I can figure out how to do this on the right hand side of my screen. So, um, I'm just going to go down this list here. Um, and I'll start from the top, which I guess is the longest time ago and try to go through these questions um, and get to as many as I can. Hopefully some of them were answered. Uh, so I see that I, I recently had two episodes of ventricular tachycardia, thir 18 and 13 minutes in near syncope. Left heart cath was clean, moderate pericardial effusion. Have you, have you, seen, uh, have you seen this in, in, I've definitely seen this in scleroderma before. That, you know, again, these are, um, these are different things that different manifestations of heart disease in scleroderma. So the scleroderma is probably causing the fibrosis, causing some problems with the electrical system. Uh, that pericardial fusion is probably a result of some pericardial uh, inflammation. So um, not uncommon. And, uh, and left heart clean, cath clean, that is, that is not uncommon either. Generally, patients with scleroderma generally they don't have significant coronary disease the standard plaque type of buildup that patients get when they have a heart attack for instance generally heart attacks are not a big part of the manifestations of this disease however you know it's so common to have coronary disease have hypertension have diabetes and different risk factors for coronary disease that patients with scleroderma can also have those and then in that case you might have some disease in the in the arteries of the heart. Um, hello from New York City. Hello. Have you seen VTAC much in scleroderma? So again, you know, VTAC is ventricular tachycardia. That is an arrhythmia. That is an arrhythmia coming from the bottom part of the heart. Um, I will say I don't see a lot of ventricular tachycardia. I see short bursts called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which is not nearly as worrisome as long um, persistent ventricular tachycardia, um, but uh, much more frequently. And I think this is 
uh, shown in the literature too, you get a lot of atrial arrhythmias in these extra heartbeats. Um, have you seen LV outflow tracker, LVOT in scleroderma patients? I, I have, it, it is not something that is necessarily part of the scleroderma syndrome of heart disease, I would say. Um, and I think, you know, when you're talking about LV outflow tract, you, it's mostly when you have sort of a kind of a constriction of that area where the blood leaves the heart, but, but certainly it can be seen in patients who have scleroderma. Um, what baseline studies um, should patients get uh, who have systemic uh, sclerosis um, and how often repeated? Well, I think I went through that in my uh, talk, but I would say for, for starters, an echocardiogram, preferably with strain, an EKG, and uh, blood tests. And if nothing shows up there and there's no symptoms, uh, repeat it yearly. Um, let's see. How can the ejection fraction be 70% in the presence of LVOT? Yeah, these are, these are a little more um, outside of how scleroderma necessarily affects the heart, but it's, it's a little complicated, but sometimes when you say LV, LVOT or LV outflow tract, you're talking probably about some obstruction of blood flow out of the heart itself. And when the heart is really pumping quite vigorously, and so then the ejection fraction is pretty high. Remember, normal is 55%. So if we're in like the 70% range, sometimes you can get faster flow outside the LV outflow tract. And so it depends on why the heart is doing that. It could be dehydration. Um, it could be anemia. It's not necessarily due to scleroderma. Um, and sometimes uh, rehydrating or giving blood will help with that. Uh, I thought a right heart cath is only indicative if the patient is going to need medications for pulmonary arterial hypertension. I, I would say a right heart cath is specifically for looking up to see whether or not um, someone has uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I, I, I think you're right. I think the initial diagnosis should be made with a right heart cath to determine whether or not someone has pulmonary arterial hypertension. And, and that can also help with whether or not the patient requires medications. And then a lot of times um, patients who have PAH will get followed over time uh, with a right heart cath um, to see how the pressures respond to the therapies that are being given and then adjust the, the therapies uh, accordingly. Um, can scleroderma impact the heart valves? Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't talk about that because it, it, it isn't as common but um, you probably didn't see it on that one slide I showed of the Danish cohort, but that was on there too. You can get all sorts of heart valve problems, leakiness of the heart valves, for instance. It, again, is not as common, but uh, it, it, it does happen. There are case reports. There are case series on it. It's just not as common. Um, does nitric oxide help with blood flow? It does. Nitric oxide is one of those vasodilators, so it certainly can help with blood flow. Um, and it can help with vasospasm too. You know, we give a lot of nitric oxide to kind of uh, prevent that spasm and, and provide more blood flow to the vessels in the, in the extremities, like when you get Renaud's or, or something along those lines. Um, let's see, there's a lot of questions here. I thought um, it, it's also necessary to see if a D sign is present, which is an issue if you are thinking of getting so they will require you to get your right heart cath prior. Yeah, that's a perfect, that's a great um, comment by someone. One thing about the, the stem cell transplantation in patients is that while they might have some amount of cardiac disease, you don't want them to have too much cardiac disease because that can actually lead to poor outcomes after the transplant. You have to have a healthy enough heart for the transplant. And there are certain things like this D sign that we look for on echo or MRI that can help us to determine whether or not, whether or not the heart is either um, is not healthy enough to withstand a, a stem cell transplant. Um, let's see. Uh, can, uh, I'm trying to let's see. I'm so recognize. I, um, uh, is there a way to get Medicare to pay for strain testing in scleroderma? 
Um, absolutely. Medicare, you know, we have a special coding to add um, strain and, and they should pay for that. Um, I, I have not had any problems with honestly, any of my patients when it comes to strain. Um, echo labs that offer strain and more and more are, um, should, you know, are, 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 a lot of them are just doing strain without it necessarily being ordered. Um, but I've never had to argue with an insurance company on, on the strain. It's usually something that can, uh, it's a very simple thing that can be done either at the time or even retrospectively after the echo is done. Um, let's see, I'm just scrolling down. Does exercise induced pH typically preclude PAH? Um, yeah. So, um, does it preclude PAH? Um, exercise induced pH is it's in, so exercise induced pH is the idea where you are exercising and you um, find that with stress or with exercise, you actually develop pulmonary hypertension. It's thought that perhaps this is an early sign of developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, we don't do it routinely uh, in our lab. It doesn't necessarily preclude, it, it, it can precede the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Exercise is a good way, like strain, for instance, these are sensitive ways to um, bring out problems of the heart that might not be so clear on just baseline imaging. Um, I had pericarditis about 12 years ago, but was recently diagnosed with diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis. I, I've also been on lisinopril for 10 years due to me having type 2 diabetes. This has put me at a higher risk for recurrence of heart disease. Um, that's a great, great question. I, I don't think we know whether or not patients who have diabetes, which could be, or which is a known risk factor for heart disease, puts you at a greater risk for developing heart problems in scleroderma. Um, it's a great question that needs to be researched um, to see if perhaps that puts you at a higher risk for developing heart problems. Not uncommon to have an episode of pericarditis and not be diagnosed with anything else, and then much later on get diagnosed with um, some sort of autoimmune disease. Um, the slide deck, certainly. Uh, my wife is newly diagnosed. She eats a clean diet. Um, any other suggestions, any studies showing that? Um, let's see. Uh, clean diet, walks four to five hours a week. I will tell you that in general, I am a big fan of exercising and clean diets. I mean, there is, I, I, I don't know of too many cardiac diseases that where I will say don't exercise and, and, and eat a, eat an unhealthy diet. I think even though we don't have the data for it, it does not hurt to try to keep your heart as healthy as possible. And that means a, a healthy lifestyle habits, which includes a, a healthy diet, uh, as well as exercising on a regular basis. 150 minutes a week is, is the current guidelines there. Um, and if you're able to do that, uh, absolutely. Um, can es oh, I just lost that. Can estrogen blockers cause the problem? Her doc suggested stopping them see if it lowers the, the bad blood test. Not aware of that. Not aware of if estrogen blockers can cause, I assume by problem you mean the heart problem, heart disease. I'm not aware of that. Can we rely on the EKG feature on the iPhone? Okay, where I think what this person is talking about is now we have these wearable you know, devices. We have um, uh, Apple watches, for instance, that have, or this, this uh, device called Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, that measures um, your rhythm. And um, they actually are very, very uh, good. They're very accurate. And they are a great way to uh, make a diagnosis of an arrhythmia. You remember that I showed those monitors. Those monitors don't last that long. I mean, up to maybe two weeks, maybe a month at the most. But, you know, these arrhythmias are, are tricky things. They can come and go. You never know when they're going to happen again. When you have an Apple Watch on at all times, you can use that Apple Watch um, at the time that you have the actual symptoms. 
and, and they are very accurate. And there is a, a way, I don't have an Apple Watch, so I don't know how to do this, but there's a way that my patients somehow get it into a, a PDF and send it to me. Uh, so it's a great way uh, if you if you can uh, get a hold of one, um, they're good to have. At what EF do you become concerned? That's a great question. I I think that ejection fraction um, that I start becoming concerned at is when we start getting lower than what's considered normal. And I mentioned fifty five percent. You know, 53, 54% might still be kind of in the low normal range. You start getting lower than that, then you start thinking there's some underlying problem. But it's a spectrum. You know, someone who has an ejection fraction of 50% does not have the same necessarily adverse outcomes as someone who has an ejection fraction of 10%. So it's not just a binary type of thing. It's either normal or abnormal. Certainly, we, we calculate the ejection fraction and we actually put it into groups of mild, moderate, and severe, um, depending on what that number is. Uh, could COVID vaccine cause pericarditis in the scleroderma patient? How long after shot would it show up? How long would it last? Oh, wow. Uh, controversial. I, I would say that uh, I'm going to start by saying we don't know. We don't have data to support this question, an answer to this question one way or the other. We have seen reports of COVID vaccines causing myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle. Generally, and it seems to be in younger, uh, typically male patients. Um, we thought that COVID itself caused a lot of heart disease, especially early on. I don't think it, we see that as much um, as we did. Uh, I have not seen, a, I really haven't seen the COVID vaccine causing pericarditis or inflammation of the pericardium. Um, so I can't really answer if it does or not, and how if it does, how long after you get the shot, how it would show up, and then how long it would last. I guess if you get the vaccine and you start experiencing any of the symptoms I mentioned before, it's obviously a good idea to talk to your doctor about that and get whatever testing you might need. Um, okay. What is a heart murmur and how can it impact limited scleroderma? A heart murmur is a really nondescript, nonspecific term. It just means that there's some sound generally on, like when I put the stethoscope on and I'm listening to a patient's heart, I can hear a murmur. And a murmur means so, there's some abnormal sound coming from um, the heart. And generally, it, it suggests that there might be a problem with the actual valves in the heart. Specifically, either they're leaky, like I mentioned, and I can hear that murmur that it makes when the blood rushes backwards, or they're sticky, they don't open properly, and I can hear the sound that uh, it makes when blood's having trouble getting through the valve itself. Sometimes murmurs come and go because they're not really pathologic, they can be due to flow. If you have increased flow in the heart, sometimes you can hear that increased flow as it rushes through the valves and you might hear a murmur. The best way now that we have echo, you know, back 40 years ago, the only way was a stethoscope and then you make the diagnosis. Now we get echocardiograms because echoes can actually see those valves and see if what you heard on exam, if it, it, it actually is some sort of problem uh, uh, in the heart. Um, it's, so to say, how does it impact uh, limited scleroderma? You don't know until you actually, you do a, an echo and we try to see what's going on. Um, let's see, do I have any patients who have lung nodules, who have mild pH on oxygen, still have shortness of breath, um, and, and you're on, on primary pulmonary arterial hypertension meds? Yeah, absolutely. I do. Um. I don't see as many of our primary pulmonary or pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. Um, I see patients mostly who have different kinds of pulmonary hypertension, uh, but certainly I have some patients who are on those uh, medications who are on oxygen um, and who have lung nodules. Um, you know, I think in terms of exercise, uh, you know, exercises that you learn in like pulmonary rehab or cardiac rehab can be very important, very helpful. Should patients with mild pH limit the altitude where they live and where they hike? 
Um, yeah, it depends, you know, what we're talking about when we're saying mild PAH, but I would say in general, if you have pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, high altitude can cause problems. Um, and so I, I would limit it as best you can. I don't necessarily have a cutoff that there might be data out there to say what um, altitude really you start seeing effects, but I would think it also depends very much on the degree of, of disease that you have. Um, all right. I see that I have five minutes. Okay. Let me see if I have any other, can we rely on the EKG? Oh, I already answered that. Oh, I got more here. Um, are pleural effusions related to cardiac disease and scleroderma? It's a good question. Um, I would say that it, not necessarily, uh, a lot of times pleural effusions can be due to, I think probably more likely lung disease than cardiac disease. Although in heart failure, for instance, you can develop pleural effusions. Um, you, you can get pleural edema too, which is a little different. It's not necessarily a pocket of fluid that you see, but you can get fluid in the lungs because of the high pressure in the heart. Um, but I wouldn't say that a lot of my patients who have cardiac disease and scleroderma have um, associated pleural effusions as a result of that cardiac disease. Um, let's see, as an adult, I was asked by a doctor if I knew I had a hole in my heart. No, I did not. And I have never given much thought because I had another doctor tell me I have the heart of a teenager. Uh, what's up? Um, uh, well, uh, I would, so, you know, the holes in the heart are a whole different kind of, um, ball of wax here, but, but people can get holes and can get be born with holes in the heart. That's most commonly how you get a hole in the heart. And some of those holes in the heart are, um, benign actually. And some of them are more uh, malignant, meaning that you got to do something about them. Uh, there is, you know, sometimes people will describe what is called a PFO or a patent foramen ovale, um, which as a hole in the heart. And it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's, it's really a hole in the heart, but what it is, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. When we're all fetuses, uh, we have this open communication um, in the top part of our heart before our lungs are developed so that the blood flow can go um, through that hole and get into get nourished and get oxygenated by uh, uh, the mother uh, because the baby can't do it uh, him or herself yet. Uh, and then when um, the baby's born, that, P that hole is supposed to, that communication is supposed to close off. But in about generally 20, 25% of the entire population, there is what's called a PFO or a patent, this uh, this communication stays open. And I, and, and in a vast majority of cases, it doesn't cause any problems at all. So you can have the heart of a, of a teenager, which I think was the example given here and have a, this, um, quote unquote hole and, um, be just fine and never have any issues with that. Um, okay. Let's see. All our doctors at Hopkins and Northwestern have said that the risk of COVID itself is much greater than the risk of the vaccine triggering anything. So we should all get the shots and boosters. Yeah. And thanks for bringing that up because that uh, is an important point to add to what I said about you know, not knowing if the vaccine itself causes um, uh, any problems with the heart. It is much, what we do know is it's much more likely that COVID itself can cause problems for the heart than the vaccine. And if your doctor is recommending that you get the vaccine, I encourage you, please, all to get uh, the COVID vaccine. Um, okay, I think I only have like 45 seconds. So um, unless I'm wrong about that, I'm just going to stop and say thank you to everyone who joined. Uh, and I think my email, or if not, I'll send my email out and all my information. So feel free uh, to contact me. Um, I love answering questions. and. Uh, I'm really uh, honored and uh, to, to be here today with all of you. So thank you uh, very much for the opportunity.